799. Now, my next guest, by his own account, is worth 450 million sterling. So why bother to work at all? Well, because he's a man with a mission. He's a confidant of Saddam, of Milosevic, of the notorious Arkham, the late Arkham, a man who claims he could have got Hitler off on a technicality. And he's now taken up the cause of the notorious Duchy Holland and John Gilligan. Will you welcome, please, that thorn in the side of the law, international lawyer Giovanni Di Stefano. Very wealthy man. I saw a documentary about you. You said you were worth 450 million well, sterling. You, you mustn't believe everything that uh, you see on television. But you're worth a lot of money. Well, I mean, you know, I can go grocery shopping and my check not bounce. That's what's wealthy to me. All right. How did you make your money? Well, I was very lucky, as I said on the documentary um, um, uh, there. But the bulk of um, the good fortune was in my time at Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Um, People know, I mean, it's a well-known fact that there were three Italians that purchased the film studios. We paid an awful lot of uh, money for it. It wasn't our money, of course. Um, we borrowed that from the bank, although the bank weren't quite aware that... That it was borrowed? borrowed it, all of it, yeah. But they still gave it at the end of the day. Um, we made 26 great uh, uh, films. We made Thelma and Lu Louise. We made a star out of Brad Pitt. We did, you know, uh, made a great film, Shattered, uh, worked with Sean Conn. We did an awful lot of like really good uh, uh, pictures but inevitably when you're borrowing money that you know full well that you can't pay back ultimately the uh, you know you have to lose that and we relinquished control in 1992 back to the bank and um, they sold it back to credit um, uh, but they sold it back so to how did you make money i mean if, if you you know you couldn't service the bank debt and you've made all these movies how, how did you end up with change uh, well i acquired uh, the cinema chain in the United Kingdom. I found the asset that had to be acquired, that there was the, it was the only real asset that was there. I paid for it in a perfectly normal and legitimate... Uh, Bargain basement price, then? Well, it, it, the bank agreed. So you can only go upon uh, the agreement. The bank consented to the sale of the cinema uh, chain for a price in 1989. I sold it back to the bank for, you know, substantial profit. It was... Well, that was the beginning of your fortune. Well, not the beginning, but I mean, we have, you know. Um, you have done something unusual for a lawyer. You actually spent time behind bars. Well, I mean, many people, uh, the so is same in de Valera, incidentally, for far worse offences uh, than what I was wrongly accused of. You have to remember one thing, Pat, that a good lawyer will follow precedent. A great lawyer will create precedent. A good man will read about injustice. A great man will experience an injustice and make sure it doesn't happen to others. And that's what started really me uh, off on. Because you know what it's like to be inside. Well, it's not very uh, uh, nice, especially when, you haven't, when, when you've done nothing. Uh, and there are many, many people, and it's no good like, you know, people sort of like poo-pooing and say, there are a lot of people who are innocent uh, in jail and, you know, that they have to be dealt with. We have to recognise that. Okay, that, that's a, a fair point. But, I mean, you said, for instance, on that documentary that you reckon you could have got Hitler off on a technicality. I didn't say he was innocent. I didn't say that uh, I agreed with his policies. I said that if there were, if we had a trial with Adolf Hitler and if it was in conformity with international recognised standards, perhaps even Irish standards uh, here. Um, if you apply only admissible evidence and not speculation or inference, um, then it would be very difficult to have convicted uh, Adolf Hitler. Now, having said that, if I'd met him in the street, I'd probably shoot him myself. But that's me as Giovanni De Stefano. As a lawyer, uh, there is no admissible evidence that Adolf Hitler ever knew and there's not a single document in the millions and millions. And did you know, Pat, that the documents were given back to Germany only in 1989, uh, uh, that after almost 50 years after the war, documents collated by... In any Germany. event, Hitler did away with himself, um, so... I don't know, I wasn't there. I mean, that's what we're told. That's what we're told. What about Saddam, your, your friend? His friend? Hardly a friend. I don't go drinking, don't go whoring with him, we don't go gambling. I mean, like, you know, I met him on three occasions for uh, uh, business purposes um, uh, there. I am 
saddened by his incarceration, not because I feel sorry uh, uh, for, uh, for him, I've told his daughter that. I feel sorry for the loss and respect of international law. The Americans and the British have gone into a country without law and order on their side, and they have almost invariably destroyed that country. And two politicians uh, uh, there, you know, have blood on their hands there, and I say so uh, 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 openly. What about Milosevic? Well, Milosevic is a, a, a different situation there for the first time in many, many years, uh, the first time ever, in fact, that NATO decided to take an action against uh, uh, Yugoslavia. I think that they took the wrong action uh, uh, there. You have to look at the Yugoslav problem from the death of Marshal Tito uh, there. As a legal issue, what they did do was something that I actually approved of. I approved of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia because at the very least we had rules and regulations where people could be tried and some have been acquitted. No, not everybody's been convicted. Um, your friend, because he was a friend, Arkham, he's now dead, he was, uh, he was killed. He was shot down, I think, in a hotel lobby, was it? Uh, in the Intercontinental. I have many friends, not all have been shot, you know, but... Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, he was regarded as a, a warlord. Um, and well, he's a photo I mean, well. part, the, the two of you look quite close, shall we say. Nothing says you cannot be a friend to your client. Uh, nothing at all there. I knew Mr. Asnatovich. Um, he was a very interesting uh, uh, type of person there. He did not deal with drugs. In fact, he's never taken a control drug in his life. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He uh, 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 took a tremendous dislike to anybody uh, being involved in uh, that business there. He was a man uh, of great patriot. Now, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, um, history. I think it was your own guy, Mr. Emmett, wasn't it, who was... Robert Emmett. That's right, who said, you know, um, uh, when he was asked, have you got anything to say? He said, I've got nothing to say. Let my silence be carried forward uh, and let history uh, judge me. Well, history will judge many, many people. Some right, some wrong. All right, so you don't necessarily say he was a good man or a great man. He just happened to be a client and a friend. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he didn't do me any harm. He didn't do the country any harm. So long as you maintained your agreement and you kept your contract with him. We had a football club together. We have an airline together. Now with his uh, uh, wife there. People said in the football club, for example, oh, you know, you've threatened people. You've uh, coerced people. That's how you won the league. That's how you got into the Champions League. I say, rubbish. How in God's name can you threaten? I mean, there's 89 games in the Yugoslav. Uh, you, know, you can't, like... Coerce your uh, way we, into we every single one. In Italy and uh, Syria, where uh, one or two games, but you can't win every damn game, you know. On well, if I'd have gone to my head as a referee, for example, I might take particular decisions uh, that I might not otherwise take. So, when you've got people whose, whose uh, currency there. is the gun. Well, I mean, that's something that's uh, predominant in most countries and now. You know, the use of firearms, the use of uh, uh, that. And it is a social problem because in 1972, uh, from, uh, that's when trouble started I in the European Union. Uh, everybody who left school had a job. Now they've got nothing to do and they are bored. And boredom breeds problems. And that's something that the government have to deal with. Not okay. what we well, well, in, our, in, in our case, in Ireland, uh, particularly in the 80s, before the Celtic Tiger came along, uh, unemployment bred a lot of problems. Um, we had a, prior to, what? Well, the late 70s, we didn't have a major drugs problem here. Now we have an ongoing uh, drugs problem, be it heroin or cocaine or indeed the importation of, of vast quantities of marijuana. Um, two of your clients are now Dutchie Holland, Patrick Eugene Holland and John Gilligan. And I describe them as notorious, and that's probably in terms of the way they are held in public esteem, is a fair description. Well, that's because of the media. Uh, uh, people look, I mean, the average everyday person has never met Mr. Gilligan, has never met Dutchie Holland. You have met Dutchie Holland and you can form your own opinion. Let me tell you, in the case of Dutchie Holland, um, you yourself experienced interference at political level 
uh, there because you held an interview uh, with him, at least in Jurors, an Irish hotel in, uh, uh, Kensington. in, in Kensington um, uh, there. And all Dutchy Holland wanted to do was to say to the Irish people, <coughs> I am not guilty of uh, murder, I am not guilty of drugs there. When I go into the Garda Shirkan, I want my interview recorded. Now, what is wrong with that? It is a requirement nowadays, in any case, because that prevents and precludes uh, uh, the Garda uh, uh, in making up and fabricating uh, um, admissions. And had your, had the interview that you conducted uh, with Mr. Holland, had that been broadcast and had the Director General not interfered with your right to broadcast that, that man would not be sitting in jail today because well, he is I mean, only... Well, we can't draw that conclusion. I mean, the... Well, I can because he's only... The, I mean, I, I've read the judgment there. The judgment uh, was based upon his admissions. He was convicted because he allegedly confessed to the Garda Khan that he... Uh, uh, had 34 kilos of cannabis. Now, I mean, do you really, are we really expected to believe that if this man is as notorious and a, a, a drug dealer, that he's going to go to the guard and say, oh, yes, sir, you know, I, I've got 34 kilos. Oh, sorry, guys, I mean, you know, you've got my own customers. I mean, come on, you know, yeah. let's... But, but from, from my point of view, I mean, the interview ultimately, uh, certainly in part, went out, uh, but not when it was supposed to go out. Well, no, quite. Uh, it went out after he was arrested. The, the editor the, in chief is the director general, so... You know, the decision is his, and... Well, he didn't take it unilaterally. I mean, like, you know, it wasn't unsolicited. I mean, he, he took the decision because uh, um, the commissioner said, oh, you can't broadcast that because that might interfere, uh, um, you know, with the process of justice. Well, what interference? With, with what? All he wanted was to have his interview with the police recorded. That is a prerequisite. What is wrong with that? Why should you not... Uh, if you are arrested, why can't you have your now, interview recorded? Moving on to John Gilligan, you're going to uh, represent him. You, you've met the two, book, two men yes, today. Yes, I have, yes. Well, not just today. I mean, I've met them before, but... Uh... Um, what's the point with John well, Gilligan? I mean, whatever about Dutchie Holland, we've talked about him. John Gilligan um, certainly has a reputation for thuggery. Well, he he certainly did attack the late Veronica Gear and physically assault her. Well, wait a moment. Uh, uh, I don't want to say anything evil or anything bad about uh, people that cannot defend themselves. And remember that Veronica Guerin was a person that actually interviewed me as well when I was in Belgrade. So I have a lot of esteem uh, 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 for her there. However, if you have to accept law and order, uh, he is innocent of any charge because that process uh, never concluded. There is forensic evidence that was made, which I've read today, I, I was going to bring it with me tonight to, uh, there, which clearly showed uh, that the uh, um, alleged ripping of the blouse uh, did not take place because this is the forensic evidence of the Garda Khan, not the defence forensic. When she went in, uh, uh, that they gave the blouse uh, there and uh, 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 and now that's one of those there. And if you think that a man who is supposed to be as clever and intelligent or supposed to be a, a, a big drug dealer would put his life at risk, even accepting that, you know, if he did sort of a uh, uh, beat her, what's the maximum sentence that he gets? Six months? He think he's afraid of he's going to kill a person for six months prison sentence? Never going to happen. He was, in any case, he was acquitted. Right. And that is the law of Island. Paul Williams, um, is this the John Gilligan you recognise? Uh, absolutely not. Um, and I think that things have been said here now and we're going down a, a sort of a road where we're going to try and imply things about Veronica Gear and our colleague. Um, John Gilligan has made absolutely every step of the way. He has never made any secret of the fact that he is a thug and he's a, he is a gangster. His own senior counsel, Michael O'Higgins, who's the best in the business in this country, who tested his cases, and there's a few things that Giovanni has been very selective about, and a lot of things, and you can't discuss the case as complex as this in, in 15 minutes. But he told the courts that his client was a notorious dangerous criminal. And Mr. Justice Johnson, in the, in the, in the, when he was convicting him of intimidating and threatening and turning the lives upside down of two uh, prison officers, he quoted that. Let me just bring one, just your attention to one thing in this. And I've interviewed scores of people in relation to Mr. Gilligan. I've been looking at Mr. Gilligan for many years. And that picture you showed there tonight, Pat, just there now, yeah. 
That's the classic picture of John Gilligan that everybody in this country should remember because every time he was going into court, he wanted to smirk at the camera and show the people of Ireland what he thought of them. And he does that every time I saw him in every court he was in, be it in Belmarsh, the Special Criminal Court, the High Court, the Supreme Court. He's always grinning, he's always laughing at everybody because he doesn't care. During his trial, his trial started in November of, uh, into December 2001. Martin Baltus, and this, this is a very central intrinsic part of the whole case with Mark, with, with John Gilligan and which the, the, in relation to Supergrasses there was an issue of corroboration of evidence. Martin Baltus was a Dutch criminal who packaged and put together and shipped uh, 25 million euros worth of cannabis and a huge arsenal of weapons for John Gilligan which went into a company in Cork and were then shipped from there up to a hotel in County Kildare and from then back to his distribution centre. Martin Baltus and that is, I, I, I'll never forget the smile on John Gilligan's face coming up to the Christmas recess in the Special Criminal Court. He smiled, and afterwards we found out why. Because during the Christmas research, two of his thugs, his hoods from this country, along with their friends in Belgium and, and in Holland, intimidated Martin Balthus' daughter. Martin Balthus, therefore, refused to come to Ireland. I saw his statements, I saw what he was prepared to give. It was huge corroboration. Number two, the most significant and most important witness that everybody in this country has forgotten about is a girl called Carol Rooney. She was his girlfriend. She could corroborate everything that went on in John Gilligan with him and his gang from before Veronica was beaten up to the time, to the day and the day after she was murdered. And she had huge and very, very significant and important evidence. Now, the Gardaí could not force her to go to court. I'm aware of what she said. I've talked to people very close to her. I may have talked to her herself. I'm not going to go into that now. But she could have hung Gilligan out to dry. And I think, in all due fairness to you, Giovanni, I think, and I know in Gilligan, this is just another stunt. But what this stunt is tonight, and what, what, what this stunt has been, would you go to see Gilligan today? Remember, he's the best legal and the most respected legal counsel and people I have huge respect for. But I have very little respect for you from the perspective you're coming from, from Gilligan. Gilligan is doing what he's always done. He's insulting everybody looking at this show tonight, every law-abiding, tax-paying, decent citizen, and everybody in this audience, because John Gilligan has no respect for the rule of law, and John Gilligan deserves to be where he is. The law is the law is the law, isn't that it? That's right. Uh, and if someone makes a mistake, the slip of a pen, a paragraph wrong here, uh, uh, maybe some procedural mistake in the arrest warrant, you figure that's, that should be a reason for getting someone out. Well, that's right. And uh, let me say, though, uh, uh, first, Pat, I totally uh, uh, agree with what Mr. Williams says. I've read his book. Uh, uh, evil Empire, which of course he must have made an enormous amount of uh, uh, money at that book up there, and it's a great book. There's an awful uh, way to that's not relevant. Really. Well, wait a second. It is relevant because people's opinions are guided uh, by what they can get out of a situation. There, we have to remember that John Gilligan was acquitted of murder. That was the finding of the Special Criminal Court, and at the end of the day. John Gilligan is convicted of 180 kilos of cannabis. Now, never mind the speculation, never mind the inference, the law of this country, Ireland, that was won by blood, says that Mr Gilligan was guilty of 180 kilos of cannabis. Everything else is irrelevant. It's great for the media, it's great for films, it's great for the journalists, it's great to write, great to slag me off and everything, that's fine, I don't care about uh, uh, that. But the rule of law is the most important yeah. thing if we have to have a right Mary, Mary Wilson is, is with us, early, be fair as far as I'm. Mary, I mean, do you go along with Giovanni in, in this regard, that even though rogues and scoundrels and criminals and thugs walk free sometimes because of flawed prosecutions, that's the way it has to be. I mean, we all know about Irish lawyers. Uh, going through every new bit of legislation about speeding and drink driving to find loopholes to get quite apparently drunk drivers off. We know they do that all the time. And, and it, it, to me, it brings the law to disrepute, to be quite honest, that kind of attitude. It shouldn't be rocket science to get it right. It shouldn't be rocket science to make sure that warrants are correct when they're issued. It shouldn't be that difficult to make sure that regulations when people are brought into custody are adhered to. It shouldn't be that difficult to take statements properly. Uh, as recently as a month ago, Adrian Hardiman, the judge in the Supreme Court, issued a judgment uh, 
in which he quashed a murder conviction. And in that judgment, he was talking about the videotaping of uh, evidence in Garda stations. He said uh, Garda were avoiding taking this evidence. He said statements were incomplete. He said that he was being told that 96% of interviews uh, with suspects in custody are now being recorded, but he said nothing like that is coming before the appellate courts. So it's it's all very well to say people walk free or whatever. What I would say is that it shouldn't be that difficult to get it right. The rules are there, the regulations are there. Do you not think, though, it's that an unequal contest sometimes? You've got a guard who spends a couple of years training in Templemore, finds himself in the street, up against the, the cream of uh, the, the intelligentsia of, of the barristerial ranks. And it's, it's no contest. It's well, no contest. Just take John Gilligan as an example. Uh, John Gilligan has had free legal aid all the way along the, the system. He has been represented, as Paul said earlier, by, if I was in trouble, uh, Michael O'Higgins would be the man you'd be picking up the phone to. He also had John Rogers recently in the Supreme Court, two, two of the most senior, senior counsel representing him, all being paid for by the state. All along the way, he's had this uh, intervention. We're still awaiting a judgment on John Gilligan in the Supreme Court, and this will be very interesting, because it's going to centre around the complete witness protection programme. That programme was brought into being um, specifically for the trials of those uh, associated with John Gilligan. And the Supreme Court may well be the court that will now lay down the ground rules for witness protection programs. Yeah. But what we have to ask ourselves, whether John Gilligan walks free or whether he, his convictions are upheld, is why it was left to the Supreme Court to make sure that that program was properly locked in. Surely that should have been done before they set out on that course at all. Giovanni. I totally, 100% agree. There is no reason why the prosecution cannot prosecute honestly correctly, diligently. If they did, you know, we, I certainly wouldn't have had the element of success with John Palmer, the timeshare guy, where uh, there was a flaw in the confiscation notice. There were five words missing from there which quashed £47 million. Uh, we would not have succeeded in Hoogstraten, where there was a non-direction on uh, uh, the question of joint enterprise uh, uh, there, and a whole heap of other... But does it not bother uh, you that you, you find a technicality and somebody who may well have killed, who may well have robbed large people of their timeshare investments, they're back on the streets with their money intact? That, that offends me, I have to say. Well, I, uh, it would be very nice if you asked that question of Mr Higgins, if you invite him onto the show, because some of the comments that Mr Higgins made uh, about John Gilligan and why he should be, uh, his conviction should be quashed are far more controversial than the ones that I'm making. Uh, Finally, what about the point that you're being exploited by John Gilligan? He's very eminent. Uh, Nobody exploits me. That's nonsense. I mean, like, you know, I'm my own guy. Don't, don't worry about so that. So why are you involved? He's got Michael, Michael Higgins doing the business for him and... Well, there's a question that there is a, a, an intellectual question on, on the extradition. I take the view that the extradition of Gilligan uh, uh, was unlawful, and therefore you can't kick in a trial if, when you go back to, to the beginning, the extradition should have been under a specific act. It wasn't. It was done. That is a technical. Okay. It's a technical thing. But if that fell down, all they do is let them back to the UK. And, no. and extradite him again and do it properly this time no, and have uh, a retry. No, they can't. Uh, th th there is legislation. I mean, th th there is case law on that in the United Kingdom. I mean, Mr. Gilligan should not have been extradited. They could have done it right. The, or exactly what the lady said. They should have got it right. If they'd have tried to extradite him under the European Convention on Extradition, which is what Ireland is bound by when they joined the European Union, they might still have got the extradition. That's the tragedy in all of this, that if they did it right, you know, <laughs> people like me, there'd be no space for us. Giovanni. Giovanni's got Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, interesting times ahead when the Supreme Court delivered this judgment.